One of the questions that is often put to the crew on a cruise ship is how does the ship get electricity? The answer is really long extension cords. So there you have it. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you found the video interesting. Okay, not really. Today we're going to look at how ships generate power and how that power is used on board. Hi, I'm Chris Frame, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a maritime history author and lecturer. I speak on board cruise ships and at maritime museums around the world. I'm also the co-host of the Big Cruise podcast. I'll link it in the description below. If you're interested in cruising, cruise ships or maritime history, I think you're going to like it here. So hopefully you'll subscribe at the end of the video. In the 1980s, it was estimated that an ocean liner the size of the 70,000 gross ton QE2 generated enough electricity every day to power the city of Southampton. That's a lot of power. And even though battery storage tech is improving at a great rate, you'd currently struggle to find a battery that could hold enough power to propel a large ship on a long distance voyage while still providing power for the services needed to keep a city at sea running. A cruise ship's power plant also needs to fit on the ship with space left over for all of the passenger facilities, crew areas and storage spaces that are needed on board. And while some cruise ships these days can run on shoreside power when docked, storing that power from shoreside services for use at sea isn't currently a mainstream option. Not yet, anyway. Instead, cruise ships generate their own electricity and have done since the 19th century. The shipboard electricity is used to run things such as hotel services, like lights and air conditioning, lifts or elevators from my American friends, as well as safety and security systems like fire alarms, navigational systems, and even things you're less likely to think about, such as cold storage refrigerators, desalination plants, and of course, the propulsion system. All of these systems are power hungry, and they take up a fair amount of space on board. On most cruise ships, Propulsion systems, giant refrigerators and desalination plants are located below the waterline of the ship in giant mechanical areas. If you're interested in learning more about what is beneath the waterline, check out my recent video about it. So we know ships generate their own electricity, but how do they do this? Well, the most common power plant on cruise ships at the moment are diesel electric systems. In these systems, diesel engines are used to produce electricity, which then powers the different services on board. These systems are a form of indirect drive. The engines are not directly attached to the propellers that move the ship. Rather, a large chunk of the electricity is used to power the propulsion motors that drive the propellers or power the pods on many modern ships. This contrasts with the direct drive systems of old. Compound and reciprocating engines and even the first steam turbines were all forms of direct drive propulsion. This meant that the engines were attached directly to the propeller shaft or paddle wheel in the oldest ships. As the pistons turned, this turned the propeller shaft or the paddle wheel shaft. On reciprocating systems, such as those found aboard the Olympic and Titanic, the main engines created the propulsion while steam was bled off the main plant and fed into dynamos, which generated electricity to power the ship's hotel services. This is one of the reasons why Titanic's lights could stay lit up long after the main engines were turned off. Direct drive engines are the simplest way of powering a ship, but they aren't the most effective. It was discovered in some of the earlier steam turbine ships that the speed at which the propeller is most efficient and the speed at which the turbine was most efficient were different. This led to serious vibration issues when the ship was run at speed. Indirect drive engines attempted to overcome this problem, though they are a little more complex and require more machinery. Indirect systems convert the electricity produced by an engine to allow it to run the ship. These engines are more efficient overall, and they allow both the engines and the propulsion system to run at their own most efficient speed by separating the process of creating power from the act of using that power. This brings us back to the diesel electric plants used to produce electricity. From the 1980s, this became the most common way to power a cruise ship, and between 1980 and now, nearly all cruise ships were built with this system on board but there were some ships that bucked this trend. A less common but important alternative system is a turboelectric plant. These systems use steam turbines, or on modern ships, gas turbines, to produce electricity. Gas turbines themselves had a boost in popularity during the 2000s, with several cruise ships built using these plants. These included the Island and Coral Princess, Royal Caribbean's Radiance class, and Celebrity's Millennium class, all using these engines. Their fuel costs a lot more than diesel, but they are significantly cleaner burning and thus considered better for the environment. Some passenger ships employ hybrid systems that make use of more than one power generation source. A great example of this is the Queen Mary 2, which employs both diesel electric and gas turbines during its cruises and crossings. 
The base load power for hotel services and slower cruising can be achieved by the cheaper to run diesel electric plant. But when QM2 needs a boost of extra energy, the gas turbine plant is activated. As the shipping industry attempts to transition to greener fuel sources, we are starting to see a shift in the propulsion of new ships. Many of the new builds are being completed with LNG power plants. These power plants are indirect drive systems, so can quite easily be adapted to work with existing propulsion technology and bring with them a reduced carbon footprint when compared to their diesel predecessors. So now we know some of the main ways that electricity is produced aboard cruise ships. But what about the less known or carbon neutral systems? Well, it may surprise you to know that there have been a few novel passenger ships built over the years, with one notable example being a nuclear powered ship. The Savannah entered service in 1962 for States Marine Lines and utilized a Babbock and Wilson nuclear reactor. This nuclear plant did the same job as a diesel or gas plant, generating electricity. The electricity is then used to power the ship. The ship's propulsion system was virtually carbon neutral, but the public's concern relating to nuclear power meant this tech never caught on for cruising. Today, research is being done into hydrogen as a future fuel source, and there have been some successful battery-powered cargo ships that are capable of operating over short distances. Another interesting green solution is being explored by both Hertegruten and Pennant. Both lines are investing in sail-powered ships. This is an interesting innovation, precisely because it isn't really an innovation at all. Sail-powered ships existed long before steam-powered ships, but over time were abandoned in favour of the certainty provided by steam power at being able to guarantee the duration of a voyage. Where Hertegruten and Pennant are looking to push the boundaries is by using wind technology to create a reliable power source, something that the sailing ships of old could never really do. With all of the advances in technology that we have had over the past 200 years, it will be exciting to see how these new ships perform. So there you have it. A ship gets its electricity by making it itself. For the most part, this is done by burning fossil fuels and works much the same as non-renewable land-based power plants. Cruise lines are making steps to source greener fuels, but more needs to be done and quicker to meet the urgency needed to fight climate change. One last point, when a ship is in port, it requires much less power than when it is underway. Generally, when a ship is in port, some of the engines are taken offline, with the ship only producing as much energy as it needs to keep the hotel services up and running. And it is here where we find a proven greener solution, when both the port and the ship are equipped with cold ironing capabilities. Cold ironing allows a ship to run off shoreside power when it is in port. This has benefits for air quality, and if shoreside power comes from renewable sources, then it has a real overall benefit for the environment. So next time you hear somebody ask, where does the ship get its electricity? You know the answer, it makes it itself. But if the ship is in port and using cold ironing, well then it uses really long extension cords. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to give it a like and please subscribe for future cruise and maritime history content. Thanks once again for watching and until next time, I hope to see you on board. I'm a maritime history writer and author, the co-host of the Big Cruise podcast. I'll link it in the description below. It was a bit weird. Don't forget to give it a like and please subscribe for future crew. And please subscribe. Oh. And please subscribe for future cruise and maritime history content.